Our society is currently in a desperate crisis situation. Mass consumerism has led us into a severe garbage disposal problem. We're running out of holes in the ground to throw our waste. To compound the problem, industry has flooded the marketplace with a wide array of toxic household chemicals and non-biodegradable plastics. What we've created with plastics is almost a supreme organic chemical. You have us, we are lowly and base organics. We're just flesh, we rot, we decompose. Plastics are almost organic, they're almost like flesh, like us, except they will never decompose. And in that way, they are like supreme flesh, flesh that will live forever and conquer. It's something I did a lot of research on, and I, what I'm doing is, um, uh, I guess it's kind of a new idea, which is to do with the plasticization of the human race, and particularly of North, North American people that a lot of times in jest or in um, conversations, people refer to each other as plastic. Hey, hey, you seem really plastic, or that, you know, that girl or that guy is really a plastic person. In fact, that's becoming very true of our society. Plas plastics have um, penetrated, uh, crept into our daily lives to such an extent People rely on them so much that, in fact, the artificial artificiality, the charade of plastic has become part of our personalities, and thus, we are plastic people. North Americans produce twice as much garbage as European countries with comparable standards of living. The disposable ethic has gripped us. More and more throwaway items are appearing on our store shelves. Where does it all go? The city of Montreal burns 90% of its municipal waste. The unsorted garbage is burned at the De Carriere incinerator, located in the residential area of Rosemont. The incinerator burns 300,000 tons of garbage each year. The heat created from the burning process is harnessed to produce steam electricity. The electricity is purchased by some of the surrounding industry. Montreal's incinerator is seen by some as an example of a convenient way of solving the garbage disposal crisis and creating an alternative source of energy at the same time. Energy from waste incineration is becoming the trend amongst municipal waste management programs across Canada. There are plans in the province of Ontario alone to build 12 energy from waste incinerators in upcoming years. What seems to be a quick and easy solution to the garbage crisis is not without its serious drawbacks. The city of Montreal inaugurated the De Carrier Street incinerator in 1970 with a great deal of fanfare. The former mayor, Jean Drapeau, called it pollution-free and the most modern of its kind in the world. And by the mid-70s, it became evident that it was, it was certainly not pollution-free, even though it was, in fact, modern. Uh, a good percentage of the dust, which is generated in the, in the burning of garbage, was not being trapped by these so-called pollution-free, anti-pollution control devices, 
and they were finding their way into the air in the neighborhood around the incinerator. We asked Catherine O'Curdy, a nutritionist who has grown up in a house built only a few yards away from the incinerator, for some impressions. There's uh, quite a few parks around here, and all the children in the area used to go to the parks uh, fairly often and to play around there. And when we'd walk by, we'd smell the garbage coming from the site. The uh, garbage is, is kept there before they actually incinerate it, and you get a very pungent stench coming from there. In the winter, you don't really smell it much. All you smell is the smoke coming from the smokestacks. Every day when the incinerator was in operation, there was ash all over the snow. Like, obviously, you notice it more in the winter and uh, it was, the snow was always black. Dust and stench have been two of the most common complaints by local residents in the densely populated area around the incinerator. There is a more invisible and threatening problem that the residents haven't been able to complain about because they can't see it. You can almost regard a, a waste incinerator as a dioxin manufacturing plant. The Swedes have done some interesting work in this area, and they were very concerned when they discovered dioxins in mother's milk. And when they did some calculations, they found that children who were being breastfed were getting uh, much too much. Uh, dioxin, even in terms of liberal limits of exposure. So they went about the task of trying to understand where dioxin in the Swedish environment was coming from. They found that the single largest contributing source of dioxin to the Swedish environment was municipal waste incineration. So we know that burning garbage um, from their work and from the work that has been done in North America in analyzing for dioxins in the stack gases of municipal incinerators, we know that incineration is a major source of dioxin. Uh, in uh, our society and probably in our world for that matter. Dioxins have been classified by the United States Environmental Protection Agency as the most toxic and deadliest chemical compounds known. These dioxins are created in the incinerator when plastics are burned along with wood and paper products. The chlorine chemical in plastics and the chemical lignin used in wooden paper products combine in the burning process to create the dioxin compound. Dioxins were the active chemical compound in the defoliant agent orange, of which thousands of liters were dumped onto the Vietnamese countryside by the American military in the Vietnam War. Dioxins are still used today in many common garden herbicides and in wood preservatives. The substance is persistent and very stable. Um, so that once it's emitted, it doesn't disappear or go away. It tends to uh, become attached to some particulate and find its way slowly up through the food chain so that we become little biological magnets for the dioxins that we have released into the environment. 
and um, you know the greatest impacts of human exposure to be to dioxin may not occur until uh, slowly uh, our children and their children are exposed to ever increasing amounts of it as they um, you know collect by eating fish and vegetables and and uh, and being nursed as babies I mean the, the dioxin that's available uh, in the environment so that's the nature of the concern with respect to dioxin and waste incinera incineration we asked Dr. Kate Davies of the City of Toronto Public Health Department what could be some of the possible health effects associated with the accumulation of dioxins in our environment. Uh, dioxins and dibenzofurans um, have some acute effects. Uh, they cause disturbances in the central nervous system um, and also a number of skin diseases like chloracne. There are also uh, long-term uh, effects such as uh, dioxins have been shown to be teratogens, that is to say they cause developmental defects in the offspring of exposed mothers. Um, they are also thought to be promoters of the carcinogenic process, uh, particularly as far as liver tumors are concerned, and they also are, suppress the immune system um, substantially. Michael Feinstad is the chairman of the Executive Committee for the City of Montreal. Notre incinérateur, qui est, qui est euh, juste en passant, un des incinérateurs les plus efficaces dans le monde. Parce que le dioxine qui sort de notre incinérateur, on ne sait pas pourquoi, est, est, le, est le niveau le plus bas de tous les incinérateurs dans le monde. Mais on ne sait pas pourquoi. Juste par hasard, c'est comme ça. Parce que nous savons, nous savons qu'est-ce qui se passe dans l'autre bête, c'est très dangereux. Mais les dioxines est tellement bas que c'est presque pas possible même, même d'avoir euh, euh, une mesure de dioxine qui sort de l'incinérateur de la ville de Montréal. Qui est fait, ça fait 20 ans, 20, ans, 20 ans que ça dure. Et la vie de l'incinérateur, on prévoit que ça, peut, ça, va, ça va continuer à opérer jusqu'à l'année 2005. There has been only one dioxin study carried out on the day carrier incinerator. The 1983 Environment Canada report found virtually no dioxins. The report admits that these results are contrary to every available study done on incinerators throughout the world. A study carried out on a similar incinerator in the city of Toronto showed that approximately four to five kilograms of dioxin were emitted annually. The report offers no explanation for the exception of the day carrier incinerator. One possible explanation may lie in the fact that the study method at day carrier was developed in part by Dow Chemical, a major producer of plastics, and also of Agent Orange. The pollution control device on the day carrier incinerator is an electrostatic precipitator. It electrically charges the outgoing fly ash and captures them like a magnet. The current device was installed in 1983 at the cost of $10 million. The precipitator is effective at capturing the large fly ash particles. However, 30% of the dioxins attach themselves in solid form to small particles which are not effectively removed by precipitators. The remaining 70% of the dioxins escape into the environment entirely unabated by the electrostatic precipitators. Other toxins created in a mass burn situation, such as mercury, cadmium, lead, arsenic, and hydrochloric acid, are also released into the environment in alarming amounts. Studies worldwide have pointed to municipal garbage incineration as a major source of these potent carcinogens. Lead has been proven to cause irreversible brain damage. Cadmium attacks the kidneys. Mercury causes birth defects. Hydrochloric acid promotes lung disease. Arsenic has been linked to skin cancer. There have been no tests at the day carrier incinerator or in the surrounding area for these hazardous compounds. There is yet another grave problem associated with incineration. What is to be done with the garbage that doesn't completely burn? The slag. You know, you have a number of toxic substances in municipal solid waste. You have mercury from the batteries that you use in your watch and in your transistor radios. You've got all kinds of plastics. You've got 
um, other types of heavy metals, including lead and cadmium and uh, all kinds of nasty substances. When you burn garbage, you don't get rid of those nasty substances. You simply concentrate them in the slag and the fly ash that's left over when you're finished burning the garbage. Um, if you're efficient about removing those toxins from the stack gases so that they don't get out the stack and expose everybody, um, you simply concentrate them in the residue. Then you've got to landfill the residue. Some of those pollutants are made more water soluble in the incineration process. Copper and I believe mercury are two substances that are actually probably more difficult to handle from an environmental point of view after you burn garbage than before. So when you then go to dispose of this residue, 25% of the waste that you started with by weight in a landfill site, you may have the same problems that you would have had um, and perhaps in some respects worse problems than had you just simply landfilled the garbage. The Environmental Defense Fund in the United States, several American states, West Germany, Sweden, and Japan treat incinerator slag as toxic, hazardous waste. In West Germany, the slag is buried in abandoned salt mines. Some incinerators in that country have been forced to close, as they didn't have adequate facilities to store the toxic fly ash. In Japan, the slag is mixed with concrete, placed in a special Class A landfill site, and the liquid affluent channeled into a special treatment plant. In Philadelphia, the cost of safely disposing of this toxic slag at nearby hazardous waste dumps became so high that it is now shipped to Panama. The slag from the De Carriere incinerator is presently being hauled off to the eastern tip of Montreal Island to be dumped at the Riviere des Prairies landfill site. The slag, which contains heavy metals and dioxins, is left exposed to the elements and seeps into the groundwater. Plans have been made to turn the Riviere des Prairies dump into a recreational ski hill once the slag has been piled up high enough. But uh, all of the studies indicate it's a question of dollars and cents. It's not a question of theoretical, uh, ideological commitment. And uh, the, uh, the cheapest method by far is, uh, is finding a place where you can bury it. That's the cheapest. Uh, and that's, that's we, all the studies show that. But there's just a limit. It's not the most uh, environmentally satisfactory uh, methods, but that is the cheapest. And the most expensive of all the systems is incineration. <laughs> but we have an incinerator. The Riviere des Prairies landfill site is not the only dump on the island of Montreal. 80% of the island's municipal waste is dumped at one of North America's largest landfill sites, the Myron Quarry. The quarry receives an estimated 1.2 million tons of consumer waste each year. At the present rate of disposal, the quarry should be filled up by the year 1995, if not sooner. Once this hole is filled, it will leave the surrounding municipalities who use the dump the dilemma of finding another acceptable landfill site or building new incinerators. It's ridiculous for us to make hundred million dollar commitments to these facilities um, when they may be far worse environmentally and cost twice as much as other options available to us. And of course, from the community's perspective, the best choice is recycling. You know, let's reduce waste so that we don't have the horrible environmental costs associated with either burning it or landfilling it. Recycling. Recycling is possible on a large scale. Japan recycles 60% of its municipal waste. Cities in West Germany and Austria also recycle 60%. Recycling can create six times more jobs compared with landfill or incineration systems. Recycling is also the least expensive method of dealing with waste. It reduces our society's need to harvest our precious few remaining natural resources. In Montreal at present, there are a few drop-off centers handling paper and bottles. The city has put very little money into developing any sort of recycling program. There are plans to develop recycling pilot projects in the upcoming years. At a public meeting on recycling, 
attended by Mr. Feinstadt, one Montreal resident, spoke out on the current situation of recycling in Montreal. And we always talk about economics, not about being profitable. I think there's the environmental point of view. I personally, I feel like an ecologist, and I think that every day is another day of more pollution. So I think an important city like Montreal, and I realize, of course, it's not your mistake. After all, we had uh, 20 years of bad government in that respect. But, uh, you know, putting it again on a long bank and saying, okay, in a couple of months, in a year or two, I think there's a need now. And, the pollution is already big enough that we have to do something with an urgency, not just saying, you know, a pilot project in one year. This is my feeling that, you know, we always think about making profitable, right, but what about the environmental point of view? I think a lot of people, they don't consider that enough. And I think there's a willingness of the population to participate, to do something. I see it in my neighborhood, you know, and I, I know a lot of people feel like me, so I, I'm disappointed that you know, your, your government says, well, next year perhaps, and next year you might hear another six months. I think it's typical political bungling. Recycling systems are quite complex and require a great deal of thinking if they are to be implemented effectively. They cannot survive on government handouts and small grants. If a municipality sets a goal of recycling 50% of its waste, then it must allocate 50% of its solid waste budget for recycling. As it stands now, recycling will remain on the back burner, so to speak, for quite some time. The city plans to run the Des Carrières incinerator until at least the year 2005. To maintain its commitment of supplying electricity to local industry, the incinerator will have to burn 90% of the city's waste. With more and more consumer products being made with plastics, the dioxin problem can only increase. This leaves the individual consumer to question the need of continually buying these products. It also leaves us, as a society, the question of whether or not we choose to remain silent and continue to accept the toxic clouds as permanent fixtures of our cityscape. <laughs>